The Holy Gospel this evening comes from St. Matthew in the fifth chapter. Jesus says, now you have heard it said that in ancient times you shall not murder and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry with a brother or a sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift right there and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and sister, and then come to offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now you've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go to hell. Now, you've heard it said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Or again, you've heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or even by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be, let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The gospel of the Lord. Yeah, you say that. Because it's in the bulletin, we said it. We're not sure we want to, but we did. Such Lutherans. So, Chris and I had a, a bit of a shock this week. Chris was back in Ohio visiting her family and found out that the, uh, the man who read scripture at our wedding one of her theology professors uh, had passed away last fall, and, and we did not know about it and, until a couple days ago. And um, he was an irascible old uh, guy. Um, and, you know, even when he was like 20, I'm sure they said he's an irascible old guy because he just came out of the womb at 74. And uh, so one of the things that he would have greatly appreciated was this, this text uh, that Jesus uh, is delivering, this little sermon uh, that I read for you, and he would have been snickering and laughing the whole time because he just knows how uh, ridiculously uncomfortable this particular section of Scripture makes, makes people feel because Jesus is, is doing something that, that often gets lost in the translations of our lives, and he's doing something that, that if we're not really closely paying attention to, we're going to actually miss what he was hoping to accomplish, I believe. So Jesus is talking about things that, that happened to us. Maybe not to you, but at least in Jesus' time, people did this. People got angry. I don't know, maybe you don't get angry, but if you get angry, Jesus got something to say, which is basically, if you get angry, you're doomed, so don't do it. Which is, of course, too late for most of us. Because by the time we hear that, we're like, well, what do I do with the last 38 years of my life? So here they go. Then he says something about adultery, but, you know, and, and, and to be fair, you know, uh, most of you, I'm assuming, are, are feeling pretty good about not having actually done adultery, but then if you've watched TV or the internet, you're, you're doomed, so, so don't do that either. And, and interestingly enough, one of the things that's very interesting, you know, I, you know in, um, what happens when, it, when, it, when, it, when a woman gets sexually assaulted a lot, it doesn't happen all the time, but what happens when a woman gets sexually assaulted, um, one of the great defenses that people offer about why they sexually assaulted a woman is because she dressed provocatively or she was asking for it or she was drunk at the bar. And Jesus' take on this is completely different. If, if there is a woman who is dressing provocatively or drunk at the bar or asking for it, then you must pluck your eye out of your own head. You don't blame the woman. You just pluck your own eye out. And if that's not enough, cut your hand off. You know? So 
I think Jesus would have a lot to say to the, to the people who try to blame the women for, for sexual assault or for rape, because for Jesus, it's not about the woman being in the wrong, it's about a man being unable to control himself. And he, the culture would just be better off, Jesus thinks, is instead of men raping people, they just plucked out their eyes and cut off their hands. <laughs> eh, I don't know. Then there's the divorce one. Now, the divorce one, of course, is really fair, because Jesus said, okay, now I get it on the, on the grounds of, you know, her being unchaste, that is, uh, her not being faithful to you, uh, you could commit adultery, but, but basically any other reason is just adultery. <laughs> you know, she doesn't love me. Yeah, too bad. <laughs> you know, she doesn't meet my emotional needs that are tenderized because I'm a mama's boy. Too bad. Jesus says, tough it out. And then there's the oath one. Now, we, now, a lot of us don't do oaths anymore, of course, because <laughs> we can't keep a promise anyhow, so what's the point of dragging God into it, right? We all know, you know that great line from Cogsworth in Beauty and the Beast? When Beast says, well, what do I do on a first date? And Cogsworth says, well, you bring flowers, chocolates, and promises you don't intend to keep. You know? So... <laughs> You know, so most of us have gotten to a point now where we're like, well, why should we bring God into our own trouble? <laughs> I'm not going to swear by anything because just because I'm lying, I'm not going to, you know, expand it. So, so we sit here and we, look at, and we look at these wonderful texts and we say to ourselves, well, if, if we're all doomed anyhow, what's the point? And, and this is why it is so important to actually have these texts read to us once every three years because there is a huge understanding of, 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 of Scripture and our faith that, that, we, that we just cannot blow by. And that is this. Every time God's word enters into the world, okay, whether it's through the birth of creation or whether it's through the baby in a manger or whether it's through Jesus preaching a sermon on the mount or Paul telling a story to the Corinthians or a preacher preaching on a mountaintop in Syria or wherever. Whenever God's word enters into the world, you and I are able to hear one of two things. We are able to hear it either as law or as gospel. So when God says, for example, in the book of Amos, that I am coming to this world to eat the rich. All right? Amos had no use for the rich. They were abusing the land and the people. And so Amos uh, heard God say that God's going to eat the rich, so Amos told everybody that. So that's the word. Now, for a certain group of people, that's not very good news, especially if you're rich. You're like, God's going to eat me. Okay. But there's another group of people who hear that exact same word, and that's great news, namely those who are not rich. They're like, finally, retribution, you know? Those are the people that are down in hell with their arms folded going, I'm just here for vindication, you know? So we've got something like the word of God coming to us tonight, and Jesus is saying this, and if you are feeling convicted or feeling threatened or feeling judged, then you're hearing that word as law. But is there the possibility that because we've we're so busy that we haven't just sat down and thought about this for a second, that we can hear the word as gospel. So let's take, your preferences? I don't care which one I take. Um, let's do the adultery one because that's salacious enough that when it's on film, somebody will actually watch it. So we're going to talk about, if salacious means like, tawdry and lewd. I'm doing that for the high school kids in the back. Um, so, so Jesus says about adultery, listen, unless, unless your wife, and, and women couldn't be divorced. Uh, they, women could not initiate a divorce. Only men could initiate divorce. So for Jesus, his culture uh, was such that it wasn't, it, there was no equality at all of any shape. And uh, so what he's doing is he's saying to men, you cannot initiate divorce on any grounds other than the fact that your wife is knowingly uh, unfaithful herself. However, if you should ever even marry an, a, a divorced woman uh, or whatever, uh, you would be committing adultery. 
And adultery isn't done when you actually do the act. It's when you think about doing it, okay? So you don't have adultery if you haven't done it. You only have adultery when you think about when you've done it, which, of course, doesn't help you because for most of us, we live as if the act is the one thing that actually matters. So imagine you come to a four-way stop sign. If you think to yourself, well, I'm not going to stop, but you actually do, that's what I need you to do. I don't need you to think about stopping or not stopping. I need you to actually stop your bloody car, right? Jesus is saying, ah, we, we're eliminating all the action stuff. You're guilty if you just think about it, okay? So in, in the case of adultery, then, we're, we're just guilty of it. And so now you say to yourself, well, I haven't even done it. So now I'm guilty of it for just thinking about it? What was the harm? I didn't even, I didn't even voice it to any, anything. And even my inner voice, you know, couldn't figure this out, you know? If that were true, I'd have married Farrah Fawcett when I was 14. You know, I mean, so it's like, whatever. But, this, but, but think of what's going on here. What Jesus wants us to see is that when we enter in to a covenanted relationship, which marriage is in this case, when we enter into those relationships which are cemented by public witness and approval, we're making a commitment to a relationship, not to our own desires or to our own needs. That what Jesus asks of us when we, when we make a commitment, an oath even, adultery, whatever it might be, is you're making a commitment to a relationship. And if you're already thinking about getting out of that relationship or amending that relationship or changing that relationship or uh, nullifying that relationship, you're as guilty as if you actually had done any of those things. Because you're already emotionally distant and cold to the person you're in relationship with. You're already neglectful and wasteful to that relationship because you're not attending to it because it no longer has value. So what Jesus wants us to see is that what, when we are in these covenanted relationships, the gospel of it is, is you're in a covenanted relationship. You have a spouse who loves you. Do you know how many people I talk to in the course of a week that would literally die to have had a date last night? They are starving for somebody to love them. They're 24, 27, 32, 46, 49, 58, 74, 86. It doesn't matter the age. They are starving for the companionship that comes from a committed relationship. And you, thinking about it, much less doing it, are squandering this precious opportunity to have someone be part of your life who loves you and cares for you is part and parcel of your journey. So what Jesus wants us to see is that, yes, these things are difficult, but there's such a blessing to have them. To be able to have a brother. Now, I have a brother, and I have been prone to anger from my brother probably since the moment he came out of the womb. You know, I'm older, so he was wrong. So, oh, seriously, tell me, any older children, am I not correct here? So, so what happens is, is that this anger, I, I, it, it blocks me from having the relationship that I'm blessed to have. It's a blessing to have a brother, someone who's with you, who, who grows up with you, who has the same kind of experiences as you, who, who understands the world from the same crazy parents that you have. It's a blessing to have that. And if you let your anger set aside that, you miss the gift of brotherhood, sisterhood, whatever it may be. And of course, when it comes to oaths, you say to yourself, well, well, God, i got to include you in on this oath. God's like, well, I hope so. Because <laughs> you think it's going to happen without me? To be able to see that you don't have to swear that you're going to do something or that you're not going to do something. 
Because the promise and blessing of God in these waters of baptism, the same water that little Silas will receive in a few moments, is a promise by God to be there with you. To never let you down. To let you stand up and keep your promises, even when you're scared of keeping that particular promise. Even when that promise is going to put you in an uncomfortable position and you wish you hadn't made it. God's like, that's all right. I got your back. It's what it means to be your God, to protect you when you're scared of keeping promises you don't intend to keep. So what Jesus wants us to hear is not that we're incredibly guilty just because our thoughts are convicting us, but rather wants us to understand that the relationships that we are in are blessings to our lives. And rather than seeing them as impediments to ways in which we can live a healthy, fruitful, and nourishing, faithful life, to see them as gifts that are given to us, brothers, spouses, friends. To be able to see that what is going on here is not something that we have to somehow try to get out of, but rather to be something that we can cherish and enjoy and live together. Because the promise of God is not that we go through this life having made sure that we've followed all the laws that we've been given. The promise of God is that we go through this life together with family and friends, with colleagues, with neighbors, so that we can all enjoy the gift of life God has given us in whatever form it manifests itself. So, when, you're re- when I read it today, if you heard a little judgment, if you heard a little bit of like, well, you know a word I want to say, but I won't say if you heard that, that's, that's okay. But I invite you to take some time this week to hear it again. To hear that word not as law, directed at trying to make you feel bad or to do better. But to hear that word as gospel, to remind you that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination and that the relationships you've been given are not relationships that you should seek to avoid, but rather you should seek to cherish them just as God will cherish the relationship of Silas at that baptism and cherishes the relationships God has with each of us. Amen.